when Bob left the New York scene, he first moved to Richmond, Virginia, and spent some time in Richmond doing different kinds of businesses, trying to find an interesting business to do now that he had made his millions in New York and moved to a quieter lifestyle in Richmond uh, into different kinds of businesses. They moved out to the Virginia countryside into a place called Whistlefield Farms, which is about 10 miles from where we are right now. During that time, he continued his explorations into the phenomena, the sound, what was happening with people. And he sought the help of people from the University of Virginia. He sought the help of friends and associates that he would met or would be referred to them. One was a very interesting physicist by the name of Tom Campbell. And Tom was one of the ones that helped Bob understand some very specific things about sound and how sound could affect the brain. And they began to experiment with some work that Tom Campbell uncovered by a guy by the name of Gerald Oster at the Maimonides Medical Foundation back in 1972 and the testing of something called binaural beating, the idea of putting one sound in one ear and one sound in the other ear. Now, jumping forward from the contributions of the early 70s into our understanding now in the 21st century, and looking at neurology. What is the perspective from a neurologist concept of how the brain is changed by different inputs coming in? Interestingly enough, the current understanding of the brain is a wet system that is based on neurotransmitters. Now, if you think back in history, there, were a there was a time when the brain, all the tissues of the brain, were actually thought of as the cooling system for the blood. I mean, it wasn't only back just in the 1800s that they thought all of this um, tissue wrapped into this very interesting pattern and you could feel your head was hot and there was heat coming off. That must be how the body cools the blood. That's what the brain is for, to cool the blood. Well. Obviously, that was a pretty simple explanation for that. And then they said, well, no, this has something to do with our thinking processes. And for a long time, there was imagery, metaphoric imagery of the brain being like this grand mechanical clock. And this was the age of mechanics, you know, the steam engine and all these mechanical wonders of the Industrial Revolution. So we thought of the brain as it's a very delicate mechanism, very much like a clock. And then the computer age came along. And we compare our brains to, well, it's like a serial processor in a computer. And we make all of these metaphorical comparisons. But you jump over into the medical community, into the neurological community, and they say, no, you see, it has to do with neurotransmitters. These are chemical interactions based on the mixture of neurotransmitters that regulate the synaptic connections in the brain and create memories and thought patterns and knowledge and learning, all based on synaptic connections regulated by neurotransmitters. So our current first part of the 21st century, our current understanding of the brain, based on history, this might not be always our understanding of the brain. We might be standing in the same era of the clock <laughs> or the same era previous. But right now, our understanding of the brain is it has to do with neurotransmitter interconnections at the synaptic level. Now, how does this sound pattern change that? Well. In the brain stem is an area called the reticular activating system, which is responsible for waking up or regulating the arousal levels of different areas of the cortex. We all understand that if a vision comes into our eyes, that in the back of our head, in the occiput, is where those visual images will be processed. But in order for that area of the brain to be alerted and say, and say, wake up, this is your stuff to process, the reticular activating system alters the neurotransmitter activity by sending up acetylcholine, noradrenaline, and serotonin through 
a set of neurons in the center of the reticular activating system called the cholinogenic neurons. The cholinogenic neurons are permeable and the, the cell walls can change and let more acetylcholine through or hold some back. And by that mechanism, they regulate whether this part of the brain is wide awake and active or very slow and sleepy. So this regulator, this reticular activating system, wakes up and regulates different parts of the brain based on the sensory mechanisms that are active. If this gets mixed up, it's called synesthesia, which is something that people experience on hallucinogenics or something with a people with a brain disorder. They, for example, begin to hear colors. Well, the wrong part of the brain is processing that input. So when it isn't working correctly, the reticular activating system and the cholinogenic neurons and all that, we identify it as some sort of brain disorder or disease. When it is working correctly, the visual signals come in, the reticular changes the balance of noradrenaline, serotonin, and acetylcholine at this level, waking up this part of the brain telling that's what you should be processing. Now, that happens with all of our senses except for smell. Interestingly enough, smell is processed in the reptilian brain and doesn't need to be passed first to the reticular activating system. When we go to sound, we think about sound coming in. Again, the reticular activating system must wake up the auditory cortex and tell it, these are sounds, my voice. You have to process this in the auditory cortex. When you put binaural beats in, then, the reticular activating system changes the permeability of the cell walls based on the information embedded within the beating complex. Now, as we talked about the binaural beat as being one sound in this ear, another sound in this ear, if we just did that with 100 and 104, we would get a sine wave pulsing of four hertz. And the brain would habituate to that very easily. Yet, through reverse and engineering, we have figured out how to recreate actual brain wave shapes by mixing a number of binaural beats together. This then, recognized by the reticular activating system, looks like a biological signal and changes the homeostasis of the brain to this new signal input. So we're actually changing a feedback loop within the brain. The brain's always trying to stabilize in some homeostatic level. And then something happens and then it comes back to this homeostasis. Then something happens and it comes back. But through the binaural beating and the adjustment of the frequencies, we can change that homeostasis level. So we call that changing focus levels from right now, which we would call C1, normal consciousness state one, to something we call focus 10. It's a different state of homeostasis to focus 12, to focus 15. So you actually are widening the scope of consciousness, redefining the state of consciousness you're in by altering the ratio of neurotransmitters to the cortex through the reticular activating system with the very, very specifically created binaural sounds that we use.